the body store of the future. Is it just possible that genetic engineering and cloning could enable us to purchase all the spare parts we need as our bodies start to wear out? Legs not great at football? Get the latest sports legs, like David Beckham uses. Or something as simple as a new nose or ear. Always hated the ones your parents created for you? Well, now you can have the Britney Spears ears. There's much talk about the cloning of people to produce their own identical twin. But the real impact of this new technology is much more likely to come from the cloning of specific cells, tissues and organs for the treatment of disease. Public debate is now shifting to consider the implications of such therapeutic cloning for replacement and repair of body parts. We'll be looking at the practical and ethical issues of genetic engineering and cloning in this episode of The Virtual Body. So, what is genetic engineering and what really is cloning? Well, we need to go right back to basics and look at why we're all similar and why we're all different. This strange yet significant conundrum is the basis of genetics. Firstly, let's remind ourselves about genes and the genetic code. At the time of our conception, the basic plan for everything about us is laid down. Our genes make us what we are. Tall, short, fat, thin, dark skin, pale skin. Each of us is unique. These genetic instructions control what happens inside our cells, and as the body is basically a massive collection of cells, they determine most of what we are. Our genes play a crucial part in making us what we are, but remarkably, it's only a 0.1% difference in our genetic makeup that makes us individuals rather than identical clones of each other. 99.9% .9 of my genetic makeup, or genome, is identical to yours your teachers and every other human being. So it's just a subtle difference in our genes that makes us unique. Each gene or group of genes codes for a particular feature and instructs our bodies to develop in a particular way. Our genes are grouped together on our chromosomes found in the nuclei of all living cells. The chromosomes can be thought of as pieces of thread with the genes strung out like beads along the entire length of the chromosome. In humans, each cell, apart from our sex cells, have 23 pairs, that's 46 chromosomes in all. If you unwind a chromosome and straighten out its threads, you'll see each thread consists of a coiled chemical called DNA. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, and it's very important because it's what our genes are made of. So what's so special about DNA? Well, DNA has a very special structure that enables it to act as an instruction manual for making the body's chemicals. And very importantly, it also has the ability to replicate itself, and so pass on its instructions each time a new cell is created. So how does it do this? DNA consists of two parallel strands linked together by cross pieces. The strands are twisted into a spiral referred to as a double helix. The cross pieces are the most important part. Each cross piece is made of two complementary chemicals called bases. There are four bases in all. They're referred to by the letters A, T, G and C. A always fits to T and G always fits to C. Each has a specific shape and size that allows it to fit with only one of the other bases to form a base pair. Several thousand base pairs make up a gene, but it's the sequence of these pairs along the strand of DNA which provides the genetic instruction carried by that gene. 
So a gene is a length of DNA that contains instructions in the order of its base pairs to make a particular protein, like an enzyme or a hormone, or a part of a protein. Scientists working on the Human Genome Project are currently undertaking the ambitious task of sequencing the DNA for all our genes. The project is investigating the order of the base pairs that make up each gene. It's estimated that the human body is programmed by tens of thousands of genes, so that's a lot of base pairs to sequence. Around three billion, in fact. The Human Genome Project aims to create a detailed map of a full set of human genes. Eventually, scientists will be able to pinpoint each particular gene on a chromosome, cut it out, replace it or insert it into another organism. The information yielded by the Genome Project is likely to completely revolutionise medicine as we know it today. The Wellcome Trust has been a key supporter of the Genome Project. Its director, Dr Michael Dexter, believes in this exciting future for healthcare. What this is going to lead to is a whole new era of medicine. It's truly individualised medicine, where we'll be treating you as an individual for the right disease, with the right medicine, at the right dose, at the right time. So now that we know all about genes, we can start to learn about genetic engineering. Genetic engineering is the technology of manipulating genes and DNA. And using a technique known as recombinant DNA technology, scientists can extract genes that code for a useful product and insert them into another organism. This technique exploits the fact that DNA is common to almost all organisms. So it's relatively easy to combine genes from organisms as diverse as humans and bacteria. Human insulin is already engineered in this way. Scientists have identified the gene that codes for insulin in human pancreatic cells. Insulin is essential for controlling the levels of sugar in our blood and plays an important role in many body functions. People who are unable to make sufficient insulin, diabetics, have to inject it in order to remain healthy. In the past, this insulin had to be extracted from other animals and altered for human use. Now, thanks to genetic engineering, we can manufacture human insulin on a large scale. The gene that codes for insulin is removed from pancreas cells and inserted into a harmless bacterium, which serves as a factory. The bacteria multiply rapidly, and at each division, the gene for insulin is copied along with the bacteria's own DNA. This is called gene cloning. Then, each time the bacterium reads its DNA to make its own body chemicals, it also reads the instructions for making insulin, and so produces this hormone in large quantities. As well as transferring individual genes into bacteria, we're also able to transfer genes between other species. The resultant offspring, containing their own naturally occurring genes and those of another species that have been inserted, are known as transgenic organisms. Meet Tracy, the transgenic sheep. The human gene that codes for the protein alpha-1 antitrypsin, a chemical that's vital for the proper working of our lungs, was inserted into her DNA when she was an embryo. This gene is expressed in her milk and can be extracted and purified. It's then used to treat lung diseases such as emphysema and cystic fibrosis. In the future, we might have whole herds of transgenic organisms, all producing life-saving medical treatments for humans and other animals. But cloning is a controversial and possibly dangerous road to go down. For this reason, research into genetic engineering and cloning is strictly regulated, especially in humans. In the UK, this is done by the Human Fertilisation and Embryology Authority. They've banned experiments on human cloning, but they do allow, under stringent guidelines, the cloning of early embryos for medical research. Before we can explore the issues of reproductive cloning, we need to understand the principles of reproduction. Let's go back to the very start of life. 
The nucleus of the human zygote, that's the egg after fertilization, contains the required number of 46 chromosomes, 23 from the egg and 23 from the sperm, and a full set of genes, half inherited from mom and half from dad. The zygote cell grows and develops by mitosis to create two cells, then four, then eight, and so on. Each daughter cell has exactly the same number of chromosomes as the parent cell, 46. The resulting embryo contains all the genetic information to develop into an adult. We've seen how individuals are made naturally by fertilization, but organisms can also reproduce without sex by making clones of themselves. Bacteria and yeast have got cloning down to a fine art. In favorable conditions, bacteria can divide once every 20 minutes or so. It's not surprising then that bacterial diseases spread so rapidly. Bacteria have been reproducing by cloning for millennia. Indeed, cloned human beings have been around for a very long time as well. We know them as identical twins. Normally, a zygote grows into a single individual by producing more and more cells that specialize to become individual tissues and organs. Occasionally, a more dramatic division occurs. And as we see from these ultrascan images of the womb, the original ball of cells splits into two, or sometimes even more. And each bundle then goes on to grow into a separate individual. This results in identical twins, triplets, or even quads. This is Charlotte. Or is this Charlotte? Can you tell which twin is Charlotte and which is her identical sister, Alexandra? Because both have come from the same fertilized egg, Charlotte and Alexandra are almost genetically identical. Their DNA is essentially the same. They are natural clones of each other. Scientists have used the principle behind the formation of identical twins to create artificial clones. As we know, cows, pigs, sheep, mice, rabbits and monkeys have all been cloned by using this technique. The cloning of whole organisms from the cells of embryos has proved very successful. And then along came Dolly. In 1997, Dolly became the first mammal ever to be cloned artificially from another adult sheep, proving once and for all that even adult cells contain the necessary information for creating each part of an entire organism. Let's see how. Using microsurgery, scientists first removed the nucleus from an unfertilized egg of an adult sheep. A complete other cell was then taken from a six-year-old ewe. This cell was inserted into the emptied, unfertilized egg. The egg now contained a complete set of genes from the adult udder cell. After implantation into another sheep, it grew into a complete new individual. Dolly is an exact genetic copy, a clone, of the sheep that donated the udder cells. In creating Dolly, the scientists proved that adult cells carry workable versions of all genes necessary to produce an entire new organism. They proved that it was possible to clone a whole new organism from an adult cell. So if it can be done in sheep, can it be done in humans? Is it possible to clone another me? A mini-me, perhaps? Well, scientists believe that cloning humans is possible, but technically very difficult. It took 277 attempts to produce Dolly. Nevertheless, providing the technique can be refined to work in other species and more efficiently, the cloning of Dolly does have massive implications for the future of biology and medicine, and for the future of the human species. Mapping of the human genome, along with cloning techniques and research into muscular and nervous diseases, means cures for a whole range of medical conditions could soon be with us. One, two, three, up you go. There you this is Theo Ems. He's six years old and suffers from the disease SMA, or spinal muscular atrophy. It causes his muscles to become weak and waste away. 
Without a cure being found, Theo will have to spend his entire life in a wheelchair. His parents believe that therapeutic cloning can provide a cure. Cheese. I feel very, very hopeful. I th you know, I can see it in five, ten years' time, and I think I'm realistic in that, you know, maybe Theo could have some sort of treatment which would enable him to wait there so he could stand, and that would make a tremendous difference to his life and to our life. There you are, you're doing very well. Professor Kay Davies is researching into nervous and muscular diseases. Her research is being aided hugely by the work of the Human Genome Project. If we can actually explore five or six different therapies in the next ten years, there's a possibility that might affect those children born today. Whereas without the human genome sequence, that would never be possible. The difficulty is, if the disease has already progressed to a certain level, whether we'll be able to reverse that. And that's the challenge, because if he's already lost lots of motor neurons, certainly in certain models that we have, we can make that regenerate. Whether those motor neurons will regenerate in that case, I can't. I mean, we cannot predict that. But if it could, of course, then we would be able to improve the quality of life of that particular individual. Cloning allows the creation of perfect match tissue. Transplants could be derived from the patient's own cells so that rejection were no longer a problem and there would be no organ donor shortage. But if indeed this is possible, it's many years away. So recent advances in genetic engineering and reproductive cloning have opened up a whole new area of scientific research. This research has many moral and ethical repercussions. Cloning of animals, and in humans in particular, raises many questions. Are scientists playing God or simply unravelling the mysteries of the universe? Could human cloning be abused to produce a super race of perfect individuals made to order in terms of intelligence, beauty and obedience? Is it morally right to clone an identical copy of oneself, or is it the ultimate vanity? Should we tamper with our genetic diversity, which has ensured human survival in the past? Remembering what can happen when diversity is removed. These and many other questions are constantly being debated by scientists, the public and governments worldwide. And that's important because all genetic research has the possibility for abuse and we have to be very careful about its consequences. In the future, this genetic technology will affect the world in which we live. To make decisions about it, we all need to understand and address it. So while this technology can certainly be of huge benefit to us in some areas, we need to be constantly aware of its potential problems.